Okay. Let's get started. Welcome everyone to the program. I am Nancy Naji, COVID-19 Watch. Uh, we will be keeping you up to speed with the economics of the pandemic. The slant we're taking today, uh, we'll continue to look at the economic performance in the first half of the year. Uh, they say, of course, you will definitely know where you're going if you know where you're coming from. So we'll be looking at our performance in the first half of this year. What were the things we did right economically in the first half? Do we need to consolidate on the good things we did? If we did not do some things right, what should we do so that we get the second half, which we're two months in, uh, better? All right, let's uh, quickly take a break. And when we come back from the break, uh, we'll be uh, joined uh, to begin our conversation on the first half economic performance of the country. Dr. Franklin Ngu will be joining me. Uh, he's an associate professor with the Lagos Business School. Hello, YouTubers. Welcome to Moneyline with Nancy TV YouTube channel. This is where we provide you with instructive business directions, processes, and guidance to help you assess the right resources to fund your businesses to withstand every form of internal and external shock. You will find here awesome informative videos on business, entrepreneurship, and lifestyle just to help you make informed business and financial decisions. Punch the subscribe button and let us drive you through the world of business. Please follow all our social media platforms on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and follow us for latest updates on our website. All right, uh, let's quickly take a break. And when we come back, it will be time for our discussion to stay. On this occasion of uh, turning 40 and marking 20 years of broadcasting, I wish her the best. I think, uh, you know, even our best is still up front. So our best is still to come. So uh, life begins at 40, they say. I mean, she, I wish that she has a blast in, on this occasion and continues to enjoy her life. Here is Topper Fasha shouting out to Nancy and asking her to keep keeping on and uh, to have a good time on this uh, very momentous occasion of her life. Hello Nancy, happy birthday to you Nancy, it's another year, it's like 365 days have gone already, I want to celebrate you because you're a star and today my prayer is that as you step into this new year, bigger things, I mean bigger things, achievements that you never even experienced in your life will come your way. I wish you the very best, I know this, that I love you and I celebrate you Nancy. Have a happy birthday and have a beautiful year. I knew her as Nancy Lowe in 2006 to 2007 when she came to Ebony State to serve as a copper. She has been a daughter to me. That's why I am so happy to be a part of this celebration. To ask the good Lord to have mercy on her, protect her, preserve her in all her doings so that she will be a, a, a good person. She will do her job with dexterity and serve her God as she has been a child of God. I bless her and I celebrate her. Hello Nancy, happy birthday. Uh, congratulations as you mark your 40th uh, birthday and also as you celebrate the Dwarf celebration which is your 20th anniversary of national television, of being on national television. Uh, I wish you the best life has to offer from African Economic Congress. We wish you the best. We say keep doing your magic, keep enjoying God's favor. Do have a great blast. Happy birthday, Nancy. I want to congratulate Miss Nancy 
for impacting me, especially to the Nigerian, especially we the youth on our program money line. I never miss this program. It was so amazing, so magnificent, it was so great. Thank you so much, and I wish you God's strength, God's favor, God mercy to carry on your work diligently. And I want to thank you so much, and I wish you happy 20th anniversary. Keep, 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 hooray! Happy birthday to you! I'm so grateful to Morning Line with Nancy. I'm so grateful to AIT. Thank you very much. Indeed, your program has, has blessed me a lot. It has helped me to aim high. Uh, let, let me tell you, currently, I'm, I'm targeting to be a chartered accountant so that one day I will be on Morning Line with Nancy. This program, right from my secondary school, I've been watching it and it has helped me to have focus. Thank you very much. Bye! Bye! And in any case, to the extent that your uh, um, production costs are not increasing, then your pricing should not unjustifiably increase also. And, and, and we're not talking about marginal or acceptable increases in prices, which normal demand and supply would always work at. And so when you talk about an equilibrium price, which is demand and supply, that is in a fair market. When you have something like an intervening circumstance that distorts the market, the market is no longer fair. And the regulators have a responsibility to come in as a thermostat to regulate what that market space is to make sure that it remains fair. Because price is something that is negotiated in a fair market between a seller and a buyer. But if a market is distorted, it prohibits gouging. And it's not only in Nigeria. I mean, it's commonplace everywhere. And I've heard a lot of argument about uh, the government engaging in price regulation or acting in a manner that is inconsistent with free markets. That's not the case. What we're talking about is criminal. It is criminal to be opportunistic and to take advantage of citizens and to uh, prey on what really is an anxiety or apprehension um, by citizens. And what the law says clearly is that uh, we have a responsibility to eliminate uh, unconscionable practices uh, and arrangements in the market. This is obviously unconscionable. And what capitalism does is to create a reasonable margin. And so when you have an unjustifiable and unreasonable increase um, in the price of a product, especially when it's a basic necessity, uh, which usually is on account of a material change uh, in the market, then that is on gouging and it's against the law. All right, welcome back. I want to say many thanks uh, to every one of you out there. The messages are still pouring in for me. The birthday messages, my birthday was two days ago, today, 7th on the 5th of August and 20th here on TV. So the messages are pouring in. I want to say many thanks to the GMD of NNPC. I just saw your message last night. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Nigerian Pilot Newspapers did a full feature on me today. Thank you very much to the publisher and to the staff and management of Nigerian Pilot Newspapers. To our fans that sent in those videos, uh, just pardon us, we could just take a few because there were so many videos from our fans and viewers. Thank you all very much to our fans, to our viewers, to our friends. Thank you very much. Like I said on Wednesday, uh, let's also still be on the journey and on the flight for more thought-provoking conversations. So we continue. Dr. Franklin Ungu is joining me right now. He's an associate professor with the Lagos Business School. Earlier on, I did say we'll be looking at the first half economic performance of the country. Dr. Ngu, good to see you. Welcome to the program. Good morning, Nancy, and uh, happy birthday <laughs> again. Thank you. Let me, also say, let me also say that we took a bottle of wine to celebrate your birthday in Lagos <laughs> because we couldn't come to Abuja to deal with you. Oh. So happy birthday. Yeah, again. Thank you very much, doctor. So you took it in as, as absential. You need to send mine, virtual wines or virtual champagne, since we are the biggest market for champagnes. I don't know if we're still the biggest market right now. There's a pandemic, though. But welcome to the program, and thank you, doctor. Let's get started, thank with, you. Let's get started with our conversation. Uh, how did the Nigerian economy fare from January? Uh, the NBS did say that the Nigerian economy grew 
at one to uh, that's grew 1.87 percent in the first quarter of this year. Uh, that's the slowdown a bit from what we saw in the fourth quarter of 2019. I think our economy grew 2.55% in 2019. Uh, the, the economy starts well this year, minus the pandemic and minus the structural weakness of our economy. Did it start well? Uh, let me uh, first of all say that it, was, it, was, uh, it started somewhat well. Okay. However, of course, you know that by... Uh, as at January, we're already hearing about coronavirus. And so the first quarter grew, but of course, the first quarter adjusts to March. Then, of course, you now we entered a lockdown from uh, uh, March as well, April, May, which is the second quarter. So the first quarter, I mean, the year started well, but the coronavirus and other challenges that we have in Nigeria, uh, which coronavirus has really escalated or for the exposed has really put our economy in a very in a very bad shape. Mm. So if you take a look at our, st of course, everyone knows that the economy has structural weaknesses, uh, perhaps as a result of poor policy choices. So the coronavirus pandemic did expose us. How much of that exposure have we, what is the magnitude of that, of that exposure? Uh, it is very, very, uh, very, very high. So, for for instance, as you as you know, they say that coronavirus kills people with underlying ailments. So, Nigeria is a typical good patient of coronavirus in the sense that we had underlying challenges. So, you will realize that before the coronavirus, we we, we are thinking that we're going to have uh, 2.18 million virus per day. Uh, that has gone down to about in the revised budget. We now have 1.7 million virus per day. We're also hoping to, we are hoping to achieve a revenue of 8.42 trillion. Now it's been revised down, which it's even difficult for us to even achieve the 5.8 trillion. So it's gone down from 8.42 to 5.08. In, that means that our deficit has also gone up from 2.17 to 5.2. And we are still, we are still counting. However, interestingly, expenditure has only gone down from 10.5 trillion to 10.27 trillion. So in that sense, the coronavirus has really exposed all these underlying challenges that we have. Unemployment is going up, inflation is going up, insecurity is going up, and even the other health challenges outside coronavirus um, issue, they are also there. So in terms of all the um, factors in an, in the, in an economy, we are not doing very well. So if consumer expenditure, uh, expenditure is also going down. And uh, price of goods, as I said, inflation are uh, also going up. So it's, it's quite, it's quite uh, very, very challenging. Mm. I like your analysis when you said that coronavirus uh, disease or COVID-19 disease affects those, impacts those with underlying symptoms the most. So our economy had underlying symptoms before the COVID-19 pandemic. But would, wouldn't you, your analysis also stretch beyond even Nigeria? Because even the countries that have strong fundamentals are still affected. The US, for example, the number one economy in the world, I think has the largest number of cases right now. The you know other economies, UK, uh, Western Europe, and all of that, they're also still suffering from uh, the, you know, is not even shadow, we're still trying to survive. So is it really a fair one to say, because we also had poor fundamentals that is hitting us the most? Exactly, so nobody is questioning whether coronavirus is a global pandemic or a global issue. Of course it is, and it's affecting different countries in different ways. So it depends on the capacity and what you have in a country to be able to withstand the crisis of coronavirus. So as I said before, Nigeria um, has underlying challenges. So even if we break it down into four major areas, so we have we are facing economic risk, we are facing insecurity risk, we are facing um, health risk at the moment, and also political risk is coming up. So the question is, how are we prepared to tackle some of these challenges, in, even before the coronavirus came in? But as I said, coronavirus has now clearly shown that we are not prepared in some, some of these, in these key risk areas 
in terms of how we are going to mitigate them. So the question then is, what should we be doing to clearly rescue the country from further uh, decline? Of course, we have the Economic uh, Sustainability Plan, which we will talk about later on. But of, there are so many things that need to be done if we don't, if we don't, if we don't want to experience further decline in the market. So, of course, the private sector, some of them have uh, declared good profit or declaring good profit. But many of many of the private sector uh, organizations are also feeling the crisis. So, in both public sector and the private sector, there are challenges, and that means, as I said before. We have many underlying challenges that we need to address so that it will help us, at least going forward, last quarter 2021, that we'll be able to um, start growing again. Uh, Dr. Ongu, if you take a look at um, how the economy has fared so far, what's your own uh, analysis? Because if you take a look at it, like I said earlier, Nigeria's economy or GDP was a 2.5%. At uh, the last quarter of 2019, NBS says we grew 1.87% in the first quarter of this year. Would you say that the economic risks that we're having right now are greater than the 2008-2009 uh, global financial recession? Don't tell me that. Perhaps it's better because we had even more buffers than I remember. Yes, yes. The, uh, what we have now is worse than what we had in 2008 to 2009 global financial crisis. And one, of, one is that uh, Nigeria, in terms of the global financial crisis, we weren't really affected the way we are now because we are not, prop we are not fully integrated into the global financial market. Not that we are not integrated, but we are not, in, in terms of that extent, we are not. But of course, you know, coronavirus is not like global financial crisis. Global virus comes to you and start affecting you, not based on external shocks, but it now brings both internal challenges and external challenges. And that's why it's, it's, it's worse. In addition to that as well, the economic fundamentals at that time, as you said earlier on, we had more buffers, and also our debt level um, um, was as much as we have now. So, so many things, so many factors that are contributing to this crisis are worse now as compared to 2008 and 2009. Hmm. Okay, um, I will come to what we should do later, like you said earlier, in terms of the economic sustainability plan, which was approved by uh, Mr. President. But are you satisfied so far with the health and fiscal measures, uh, health, fiscal and monetary measures put in place by the government to address the issues we see now? I chose my words carefully. The health, the fiscal, not P, H, I well, physical. Yes. No, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining it to our viewers. I know you understand where I'm going to. <laughs> I mean FIS, yes. So the health, the fiscal, as well as the monetary intervention so far by the government, is it enough to help us survive this crisis, to help us resuscitate and recover? Uh, the government is trying, but what we have at the moment is not enough. And as I said, you can put the physical and monetary into the economy. As I, we have four major types of risk that we're facing in Nigeria. So we have the economic, which takes, off, takes care of uh, the physical and the monetary. Then we have the health challenge, we have insecurity, and we have political risk. So in terms of the economy, in terms of what we have in the fiscal and monetary policy, no, we, we are not yet there. 2.13 trillion for the economic sustainability plan is good, but the question then is not is not enough in terms of the the cash. But the question then is in terms of implementation. So, for instance, where it's a twelve month or one year plan, but of course you know we're already in August and rainy season is fast disappearing. And if you're talking about if we are saying that we're going to use agriculture to revive the economy, we are still we've not seen the twenty thousand to hundred thousand that uh, each state is asked to provide. And the question is what will be planted and when will it be planted? And how will, then, how will it now uh, uh, yield the required revenue to help us to achieve what we, what we want to achieve? So in terms of the economy, and also in the monetary policy, of course, IMF is still saying, which I agree as well, that we need to also have a unified monetary um, foreign exchange regime, which is very, very important. You can also see what is going on with dollar and Naira. So there is also, when, when we bring them down, then of, and, uh, two principal factors in terms of unification 
of the exchange rate and also mopping up of liquidity will give us a better exchange rate than what we have at the moment. So in terms of monetary policy, there are also certain things that we can still do. And in terms of fiscal policy, while the government is trying to increase revenue through tax, IMF has also cautioned that we should be careful the way we are increasing tax in Nigeria because, of course, the consumers are already challenged. So we also, as I said earlier on, our expenditure, while every other thing is going down, our expenditure has only gone down from 10.5 trillion to 10.27 trillion. What that means is that the cost of governance is still very, very high. So the question then is, what are we doing with regards to the challenge that we have in terms of reducing the cost of governance and in terms of also seeing how we can quickly diversify the economy to achieve more revenue from oil, which we, we, we can talk about later on. Uh, so that's the, the economic aspect. Then if you now come to the health aspect, particularly the coronavirus, we, people might believe that the numbers are going down. But if you do further research, you find out that many people are not going for the test again. So people are reluctant or some, because some people are complaining. That sometimes when you go for the test, it takes time for you to even know whether you are positive or whether you are negative. And there's also the stigmatization of people that test positive. So there is a reluctance in people's willingness to really go for tests. So that's one challenge. The second challenge is in the health sector is that other ailments are still there. We don't have the necessary health facilities across the states and, if, and, and local government or, and all that. So all that, we still have them. Then when you now come in terms of what will even help the economy, the insecurity, there's still pervasive insecurity in the country, which is affecting everything. So we can see what is going on in southern Kaduna. We can see what is going on in Medugri, in northeast. We can see what is going on in other parts of the country. So the insecurity is still a very, very serious issue. So if we combine all that, we say that we still need to do more. What we are doing now is not enough, and we need to do more. Now, when we now combine it with what is emerging in terms of the political risk, so we are now in 2020, and we are now looking at 2021. So for us to really grow the economy, we need to combine both uh, local and external. So how do we attract external investors or foreign investors into Nigeria? They are listening, they are monitoring what is going on with preparation for 2023 election. And in terms of how do we now quickly, which I can come to later on, how will the federal government or even the governing party clearly make a forward guidance statement in terms of how 2023 election will be, in particularly in terms of who will, uh, where the presidency will be zoned, so that it will calm down the economy as people there, so that we more transfer, we more, more economic activities, and even investors will have the assurance that political risk will not be very really high in Nigeria in 2023. Mm. So if you bring all these factors together, economy, uh, health, insecurity, and political risk, we have challenges. And we have to quickly do something in all of them to be able to make sure that we can grow the economy better. Uh, doctor, you said quite a lot of things, and I've tried to keep up with you in terms of perhaps getting what your solutions are concerning what you've said. You, let me start from you. You also mentioned that the monetary authorities need to do more. What do they need to do? You talked about the foreign exchange, Naira against the basket of major currencies also being unified. What does a unified Naira, what should a unified Naira's value look like? Let's start from there. So if we look at the different uh, windows or different exchanges that we have, when, we t when you take the average and you now do a bit of more pop as well, so you will be getting about 400 to 420 as the exchange rate for Naira. So that, is, that should be the band that we are looking at. But currently it's going at about, 4 point, 4 and some, about 460 something or 470 something. So, so what I'm trying to do is that when we have this unification, then there is also need for maybe a, a kind of mopping up the liquidity in the, in the so that more, less Naira will, uh, will be chasing the dollar. So, it will now, so that if, at the end of the day, the exchange rate that we are looking at will be at around 400 to 420 as the case may be. So that will give a, a better assurance that this is where we are. Not today you go, it's 450, tomorrow you go, it's 460, next tomorrow you go, it's 470. So the volatility will be controlled if we have a unified exchange rate. Okay, are, are we now talking of a unified exchange rate or what exactly is the fair value of the Naira in a pandemic worsened economy? Can we really get the fair value of the Naira right now? 
or we are looking for a correction, we are looking for an adjustment? No, it's, they, they, they are all related in the sense that when you look at the uh, purchasing uh, power parity and you now combine all these other things that I've explained, I mean, you'll be looking at about 400, but when you now combine other factors, that's why I said that the band will be around 400 to maybe, maybe 425 or 430 will be the fair value of Naira at the present moment that we have. Okay. So that's, it's not really about we demand it. It's about the market fundamentals in terms of what we have in our foreign reserve, in terms of what we can achieve in terms of our revenue diversification, in terms of what we can achieve also with the remittances that we might really likely go down, which we know that it's going to go down. So when you combine all these factors, and other things I've explained with regards to risk, that will help us to get a better assessment of what would be the reasonable, or let me use your word, fair value of Naira. Okay, the question now is that with the Naira's decline to around four something to the US dollar, um, of what impact will it be to Nigerians, especially having in mind that we're still an import dependent economy, though the government is trying for us to, you know, go into areas that we could have a comparative advantage in agriculture and all of that. We should eat what we produce and produce what we eat. Uh, how much of that depreciation would affect Nigerians and affect the businesses? Because if you take a look at it, some of the things that are imported, uh, their prices have skyrocketed and we are not an export driven nation. So one would say, you know, why would the Naira be at 420, just like you say, now, even 450? Or even at 380? Uh, it's still exorbitant. Let me, say, let me say that under normal circumstances, um, Naira is already devalued, even at 305 or 360 at, or 380. And of course, if we have an export oriented economy, some people will argue that it is good for the country in the sense that it will help us to export more. But even if we have at 400 or 410 or 420, as I earlier said, what we are supposed to do is how do we quickly diversify the economy? And in terms of, let's so say if we look at the economic sustainability plan, they said they're going to use about 600 and something billion Naira for agriculture. So the question then is, how do we implement it to achieve what we want to achieve? And look at the way our debt is going, is, is skyrocketing. And the question is, what do we do to actually be able to be in a position to actually move the economy forward and also pay our debt. So I will use agriculture as an example. I'm not sure if we are aware that Indonesia made about $12.8 billion from palm oil and coconut, palm tree and coconut in 2018. That is about 5 point something trillion Naira, depends on the exchange rates you use. So the question is, if we are saying that we want to use 600 something billion Naira, can we not say, let's be very clear, and say every state in Nigeria, we should identify at least 10 economic trees. And we'll tell every state in Nigeria to plant the improved seedlings of these trees. So a typical example is that if you plant 100 million trees, it will cost you, maybe at, at 250 per one, it will cost you about 25 billion naira. But in three years' time, some of them, you'll be getting about 2.5 trillion. That's the revenue. So that, I'm trying to explain to you how we can actually diversify the economy quickly. So, in, so if, for instance, we say from the economic sustainability plan, every state in Nigeria should plant 20 million economic trees, that will cost each state 5 billion. In 36 states, we give us 180 billion. In terms of the revenue per state, we are looking at 500 billion from three years when the, fru the, fruit start, uh, when the tree starts fruiting. That is 500 billion per state. 36 states will give us 18 trillion, and it will cost the whole state to do this 180 billion. So even if you remove 200 billion from the economic sustainability plan budget for agriculture and use it to plant economic trees, it means that in three years time, you'll be getting close to 10 to 18 trillion. And that will help us to, and of course, particularly most of this should be exported. And that will help us to increase our revenue. That will help us to pay our debt. And that will help us to clearly diversify the economy, create jobs, Security will go down. So I've used that as a typical example of what we can do. Another thing that we can also do is to look at how do we reduce our cost of governance, which is unbelievably very high. As I said, the revenue, everything is going down, but our budget, our expenditure is still very, very down. The third thing we, have, we can do is to say how can we restructure or devolve powers from the 
federal government to the state and local government to liberate the economy more. We also have to, as I said earlier on, how to rethink our monetary policy. How do we expand our uh, 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 revenue from agriculture? And other things that we can do that will help us to achieve what we want to achieve. Then, uh, and secondly, how do we tackle insecurity to enable people to actually go into uh, productive activities? And last but not the least, we can also do self-government assets to raise short-term revenue. But as I said earlier, said, uh, said, said, it's also very important for the federal government and APC to provide a forward guidance with regards to 2023 political uh, presidential election to be able to curtail or mitigate the, the political risk that is emerging. Mm. Doctor, you've said a lot of things. Let me probe further. You know, so let, let's, let's see how we'll take them. You, you just gave a clear example of how we can quickly get some gains, some share short gains between now and the next three years by planting economic trees. It takes funds and money to diversify. Yes or no? Yes, it takes, yes. Yeah. But we already have a budget of 600 and something billion in the economic sustainability plan for, uh, uh, that is, we have 2.3 billion yes. for agriculture. So what I'm asking is, or what I'm advocating is, is it not possible for us to say, let's just use 200 billion and go into this planting of uh, economic trees that will give us what we need? I'm not sure if you are aware, the coconut that we consume in Nigeria mainly comes from Ghana. So that's, that's, that's a typical example. And if Indonesia can make $12.8 billion from only two trees, palm trees and coconuts, I don't see any reason why Nigeria should not aim to achieve something like that. Given our comparative advantage, given our fertile soils, and given the, what, the rivers and oceans that we have in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's not a rocket science, it's something that can be done. Um, some people are already doing it at, at individual, on an individual level, and they're already uh, reaping the benefits of such, of, of, of such engagement. Now, isn't there a risk also of still being an export-dependent country in the sense that because what a lot of people have been clamoring for is not diversified government revenue sources, uh, just like what you said, isn't there a risk of exporting raw materials, raw coconuts, raw palm oil? Why can't we create value along the chain? So is it just well, we about you know, exporting the nuts or the coconut or whatever, or cocoa, for example. Why can't we have chocolate making factories here? I think the biggest chocolate making factory uh, in the world, I don't want to name names, but a lot of us eat their chocolates, make over 2 billion chocolate bars a year. And if you no, dollarize I, that, you will understand what I'm talking about in terms of dollar value. I, I understand. I'm not saying that we should export only uh, raw materials like palm oil or raw coconut and all that. All I'm trying to say is that let's increase our output. When we increase the output, even the foreign direct investors that we are looking for, we, on their own, locate to Nigeria. And because they know that they are, the value chain will be tremendous, that is across these different economic trees. So you mentioned, for example, chocolate. The same thing with palm oil, the same thing that you can do with the same thing with coconut, the same thing with avocado, the same thing with uh, uh, um, lemon, the same thing, so many of them. An interesting thing that we have a competitive advantage in many of these crops. So a typical example is that the palm tree that we have in Nigeria, oh, about 80% mm. are, are perceived to be planted by birds and rats. So it's not, it's not even that we have a strategic way of planting uh, palm trees in Nigeria. So we've already done about 20%. And if you go to a Komu palm plantation in Benin, you can see what they're doing there. And if you look at their share price in the stock market, it tells you the opportunities, opportunities in, that, in that space. So I'm not saying we should just export raw material, but what I'm trying to say is that when we have that output, even foreign investors will come here, but what is important is that we have more revenue, that we're not depending on, on, on oil alone, and then borrowing. Of course, the way we are borrowing is not sustainable, is not encouraging, and is actually a lack of creativity and innovation on the part of the government. Okay. Um, so with all this that has been said over the years, why is it still difficult to implement some of these policies? Because it seems that the way we are saying it, it could be so easy on paper, but implementation, why are the authorities Finding it hard to implement this, you know, they will say, okay, people are not in government. You say anything you like. But when you come into government, you see that 
the systems of government may not even allow you to implement some of those changes and reforms. You said, uh, it, you uh, said it's not rocket science, but for the government people, it's like rocket science. Uh, it, it, it is not rocket science. And anybody arguing that um, when you come into government, you find other things. I always say that there are some people that, that have been in government that have done few um, commendable projects which can be copied. So if it's possible for them to do that, it means that other people can do it. Of course, we know that there are, there are bureaucratic bottlenecks and all that. There are also other factors in Nigeria. And that's the reason why I've been arguing that it is very, very important that we look at how do we devolve powers in Nigeria, in particularly removing some of the items in the exclusive list and moving it to states and local government, and also our recruitment process. It's one example that I will mention is that if you're able to, we have about 68 items in the exclusive list. It means that the federal government is doing too much. They should release and relinquish some of these uh, 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 items to the states and local government so that even the private sector can engage with them. So a typical example is mining. You can't do anything in any part of Nigeria without federal government approval. And I, I was in a workshop of mining sector and even the mining, federal ministry of mining acknowledged that many states and other, fact, other people sabotage the efforts of the federal government to really achieve the, the, uh, the mining aim of the federal government. So another aspect is, for example, railway. You can't do any railway in Nigeria without federal government approval. Or the same thing with Nigerian waterways. So these are some of the areas that we can open up and allow people to come in. So people saying that it is difficult to achieve is because of our structure of governance, which we need to sit back and say, how do we address this? Another reason is because you don't do anything, you don't do much, and every month you receive allocation from the federal government. Or the federal government receives gets money from oil. So we are not really, there's really nothing forcing us to, to work very hard. And if we, if, we, if we don't get money, we just borrow at the end of, and we say that we don't have. So what I'm trying to say that if we have focused leadership, determination, creativity, and innovation, some of these things are possible to, be, to, to do. Do you think that with all this talk and with all this uh, solutions that have been even given over the years by people like you and others, that the government is really open for business through actions and not just by words, that the government is really open to do some of these things? Earlier on when you spoke, you did say that perhaps government should also sell some of its assets. Do you see a ready government to do all of this? If there are 68 items on, on that list, the, the federal government is so burdened, and it's small thing even in the states, they look up to, to the federal government, but the states can also generate so much revenue than they're doing now to be able to sustain themselves. No, I, I think that, um, just as you said, the structure of governance in Nigeria needs to be properly looked into. And I said earlier on, most of the state governors in Nigeria I will still repeat it. They are not really thinking about the states. They are just there collecting money every month, and they don't do much. So if you re-examine some of the things I've earlier, earlier, earlier mentioned, the government seems to be trying, but they seem to be talking more than taking action. And that is the same thing with, with uh, state government. So okay, we talk uh, more uh, OK, doctor, let, let me butt in here a bit. If they are talking more than they are taking action, is that perhaps a bit pretentious in the sense that they, they prefer the system to be like this because it enriches a few, you know, and not for public good. So uh, they wouldn't really do as much as they would do to ensure that pub public good takes a more significant space. No, I, I think I would be a bit, um, of course, that there will be some selfish interest or personal interest in, in government activities. But I think that it is more to do with the structure of governance that we have in Nigeria, which now enables or stimulates that kind of uh, pursuit of selfish interest. So I'm not sure that the federal government and also some other factors might actually contribute to this issue. But in terms, for example, there needs to be more readiness, more um, um, willingness on the part of the federal government to do certain things. And I think that particularly the PNB government seems to be very slow in taking certain actions. 
So I mentioned, for example, selling of government assets. It's been on the pipeline since the government came in. And we are now five years down the line, and they are still, they are still talking. And I, another thing you have to realize as well, that for anything to happen in Nigeria, there are so many committees, so many uh, protocols, so many engagements. You engage with the federal, you engage with the state, you engage with the private sector. But when you devolve powers and the federal government will focus on particular things, it will make it a lot easier for the private sector to even engage with the federal or with the state or with the local government because they know that if you engage, for example, with a state governor and you finish with that governor, that means that everything will start taking place. But when we finish with the governor, then you will now go to the federal ministry before you now go to the presidency. So the, it's complex and it takes a, long, a lot of time. So the solution to this is how do we rethink our structure of governance. It is cumbersome, it is complex, it's not helping. And of course, some people will take advantage of this complexity to achieve their own parochial or uh, selfish interests. Doctor, let's talk about the debt levels so far uh, in the country and the borrowing. We've seen the controversies over the past few days uh, at how much we borrow. Oh, China, if we are not able to pay China, they will take our assets. Uh, what do you think? The DMO on the DMO's website is there, $3.1 billion being owed uh, to China. We have $27 billion, uh, you know, uh, debt and all of that. W what's your own view of our debt situation? And is our borrowing situation that bad as being touted? Uh, personally, I've written many articles in newspapers arguing that the way we are borrowing is not sustainable. It also shows a lack of creativity and innovation on the part of the federal government and even the state government as well. So I completely agree that we are borrowing too much and we are not actually, I'm, I'm yet to see a repayment plan of some of these loans. So with regards to the Chinese loan, of course, if you follow what has been happening in different parts of the world, particularly in Africa, in terms of other countries that have failed to repay the Chinese loan, and the way the Chinese government has taken over critical assets in the, in, in, in the countries, so maybe to be able to get back their money. So it is an issue that we need to clearly look at. And I also think that there is a need for more transparency and accountability on the part of the federal government. In the sense that some people are already arguing that everything should be made open. And I think Nigerians deserve to know exactly the terms and conditions of some of these loans. In the sense that if, we are, if it's not going to make an economic sense, and in terms of the viability of the project and the possibility of repayment, repaying this loan, then it should be something that we have to rethink very well. And if you also remember what is going on with the P&I &ID issue, the Azura Power Project, and other projects in Nigeria, you begin to really agree and accept the suspicion of Nigerians with regards to this Chinese loan. So it, there are issues there, and there's need for more transparency, accountability, and inclusive stakeholders' engagement for us to be able to achieve what we want to achieve. Okay, uh, uh, Doctor, we have less than five minutes to the end of the program because I'll be uh, moving over to a live broadcast soon. So if you can answer all those questions in five minutes and let me start. You talked a little bit about oil price earlier. We know what happened with oil price, I think, in February or so when Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, were fighting, you know, like they say, two fighting. But we saw even within the pandemic, we saw oil price fall to a negative. How much of a fall in oil price and low demand of, of fuel has affected Nigeria? Is it more about uh, lower demand and a fall in oil price than even the pandemic itself? The second question also is the question of states, because I know you talk about states a lot, that our attention should be focused on states. A lot of them have slashed their budget. River State has slashed its budget by over 230 billion. Lagos State, 248 billion slash. They are suspend, some are suspending payment of minimum wage, some are suspending infrastructural projects and all of that. What do you have to say concerning that? The third one is your outlook for the second half of this year, which we are two months in already. So your time starts now. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Let me start by saying that the fall in oil price uh, the, and the other factors you mentioned, they are all related in the sense that uh, with, with COVID, many economic activities in different parts of the world came to almost a standstill. Of course, you know, the airspace closed, many uh, uh, countries shut down. So that means that the demand for oil went down. And when the demand goes down and the supply 
even remains constant, the price will definitely come down based on pure demand and supply. So all this contributed to, 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 to the fall in, in, in oil price and, and what we have at the moment. The second, this, can you repeat the second point you mentioned? The, the again, second please? point is about states. You know, they, they've yes. slashed their budgets and it's, a lot of economic activities also happen in states like Lagos, Rivers, Kano. All the states have slashed their budgets by over, at least from 30 billion or 40 billion and above. Yeah, so I have on many occasions argued that it is time for us to say that the, what we need as governors are people who can say that after four years, I will not depend on the federal government for anything. So once the federal government sneezes, the state will catch cold. It's not supposed to be so because we're already approaching a federal uh, structure. So what I'm trying to say that each state governor as the CEO of the state should sit back and rethink the potentials of the state and what they can do to achieve that. There is no state in Nigeria that is not viable. I just explained something with agriculture. It means that if a state governor decides and say that we want to plant 20 million economic trees, it means that in three years, that state government will be achieving 500 billion Naira revenue. I'm not sure there's any state in Nigeria that achieves that even um, most of the ones that are doing very well, when they achieve 20 billion as internal generated revenue, we'll be clapping for them. So even if they do just 10 million economic trades, that will give them 250 billion Naira in a year. So in terms of state government, I really think that we need to keep asking our governors questions. They are not doing what they are supposed to do. They are performing grossly below expectations. If you leave Lagos, Kano, Rivers, maybe a bit of Enugu, many other states are just lying, lying, lying there. Nothing much is happening there. And these are states that with enormous potentials that the state governors can really sit back and say, how do we create a better state for, okay. for my people? Then with regards to the economic outlook, that is uh, um, second half, and maybe going to 2021, I think that it's still going to be very challenging. Coronavirus has not ended. The fundamentals are still there, even though oil price is going up a little bit. But as I said before, the key, the four risks that we have are still there. One is economic risk. I've talked about it. Second is the health challenge. I've also talked about it. The third one is insecurity. You can see it's still very, very pervasive. And the fourth one, which is very important that we actually try to mitigate it at the moment, it's the political risk. Mm. So if you follow what is going on at the moment, some people are saying that if the presidency is not zoned to the south, that the Nigeria will break up. So, and also I say foreign investors are listening to it. So there is a link between politics and the economy mm -hmm. and the way the economy will perform. So I think that is also very important if we want to mitigate this. For the federal government or the APC, we say clearly, and PDP will also clearly, the presidency will be, will be zoned to the south. And if possible, they can actually say that it's also possible to go to the maybe southeast because they've not produced a presence of Nigeria, so that the accession will come down and economic activities will, 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 will really pick up. So these are all the factors that are supposed to look into and make critical statements okay. or critical policies that will achieve a better outcome for Nigeria. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor, for speaking with us today and lending your voice uh, to this first half economic performance conversation. Thank you and, and have a great day. Thank you very much for having me, and happy birthday again. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you, Doctor. All right, I've been speaking with Dr. Franklin Ngu, who is an associate professor with the Lagos Business School. Um, we'll be having a state broadcast right now by the governor of Edo State, Godwin uh, Obaseki. Uh, we'll be seeing you all on Monday. Continue to be the best version of yourself. Continue to keep safe. Coronavirus is real. Don't think it's a disease of, for big men. Mask up, wash your hands, use your sanitizers. I'll see you all on Monday, God willing. Have a great weekend. Thank you for watching our video. Please hit the subscribe button below, turn on post notification to follow all our updates.